Welcome to Tripod, our travel retail theme podcast series in collaboration with the SEVA Group. I'm Martin Moody. I'm Roger Jackson. We have a very special guest once again on the show. Just tell us briefly about that. Yeah, we've got Ignacio joining us from Bacardi Travel Retail. So Ignacio is a marketing director. Um, so I think it'd be really great to hear from a marketeer on their views of what's going on at the moment and the health of our industry and understand a bit more about him. He's had a fascinating career, uh, worked at Diageo, worked for Philips as well. So not somebody who's just always been in the drinks industry, but someone who finds themselves back in our industry. Um, so I think it'd be great to hear from him. Uh, he's a really nice guy. I, I was lucky enough to have a chat with him a few weeks ago. And uh, I think it'd be really good to hear his thoughts. Brilliant. And of course, he walked into this job with Global Head of Marketing at, at a... At a a very strange time really September yeah. last year yeah. as this pandemic raged and I'm sure we're going to talk about that raging pandemic today where should we start I think we've gone from a you know if we all go back to say October November I think everybody was relatively in a positive mindset waiting for vaccine I think we're now in a situation this is just my personal view Martin we're in a situation where in most of the developed countries now have got very high vaccination levels you know, um, and I think, you know, it's spreading now, which is great, vaccines are going. And I think everyone can see vaccines play a huge role in this. I think in my view, masks, social distancing, obviously is still important and plays another part of the fight. I think the interesting part for me now is treatment. So we've gone from race to vaccine, now it's race to treatment. And I, there's a GSK trial going on in the Middle East that, um, they released some data out two days ago. It had a hundred percent success rate. So essentially, a hundred percent of all, I think it was ten thousand people uh, on contracting by um, COVID and being testing positive. They then took an antiviral, uh, it's a, it's, um, an antiviral drug, which has then got antibodies and uh, other un- ingredients in, and it had a hundred percent success rate in ensuring minimal. Uh, side effects from COVID and also obviously no hospitalizations and of course no deaths so I think we're now in the race to treatment because uh, the way I see this now is that if we can vaccinate which I think we will and we'll you know most countries are doing very well with that now we then obviously continue with measures like masks um, PPE and uh, social distancing and then I think if you've got an effective treatment that people can either carry with them or get access to pretty quickly, I think that's when living with the virus becomes a lot easier because not only have you got some preventative measures, you've also then got something that will take any burden off um, healthcare systems. And I think then, um, and it feels like we're not too far away from that, I think then we'll see an opening up of countries willing to talk to each other and opening these travel corridors that we, we expected that hasn't really happened, to be honest. So this episode's special guest is Ignacio Vasquez, the global head of marketing travel retail at Bacardi, one of the drinks giants of the world with a glittering portfolio ranging from Benedictine to Bombay Sapphire to Bacardi itself, of course, from Grey Goose to Patron, from Martini to Dewar's Otard to Santa Santa Teresa Rum and plenty else besides, including, I must say, an outstanding single malt portfolio Featuring, I declare, Roger here a bias, as it is my all-time favourite single malt, Craig Alaki, Aberfeldy, Royal Brackler, and others. Now, Ignacio assumed the role at a pretty interesting time, September 2020. Tough time to come into a head of marketing role in travel retail, several months, of course, into the COVID-19 pandemic that still rages. So welcome, Ignacio. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Pleasure to be with you today and with Roger. Hey, Ignacio. How are you well? Hi. Uh, great to have you on the podcast. I guess the first place I'm going to start when we have a look at your career is you've been a bit of a globe trotter. So Madrid to UK, New York, back to UK. Would you just give us a bit of a feel of what it's been like to do all of those moves and what you've experienced and uh, what, how you, it's got you where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, 
Yeah, I guess after 15 years of um, moving from place to place and, uh, uh, you know, working in different companies, I can definitely say that uh, I'm a globe trotter, and uh, not only me, but also my family. So obviously, uh, uh, we, we, um, we do it as a team, and it's my wife and then three beautiful girls, uh, two made in Norway and one made in Sweden that uh, I will speak about later probably. <laughs> Uh, but it's been the three of us, and uh, lately as well, we have a, a latest acquisition, and that is a tiny French bulldog born in the UK called Mocha. So that's uh, that's the uh, the team together. And um, yeah, I think uh, well, it all started really 15 years ago. Um, uh, my my first job was in in Bain and Company as management consultant. Uh, really enjoyed that uh, that period. It was in the Madrid office, uh, vibrant moment. It was just uh, about to. Uh, it was just when the when the internet bubble was about to burst, so we had a huge amount of IPOs and companies uh, coming to us to really get advice and help them go big uh, in the online world just before the catastrophe would uh, would appear. So that was a really interesting point in time to see the pre and the post. Um, uh, but yeah, that that was really a, a very interesting time. I spent three years in Bain and then from there did my MBA in Barcelona. And I think that point in time for me was really um, an inflection point uh, in my career and in my life because two things really happened there. And I like to call them like two life stories, uh, two love stories, sorry. The first love story uh, was really uh, that I met who today is my wife, a beautiful blonde Norwegian. And uh, definitely I can, uh, um, I can guarantee that the uh, story about opposite sides attract is, uh, is confirmed, at least from my side. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, it's a happy story to date. So uh, fingers crossed that it continues like this. And the other love at first sight was my um, first encounter with the world of spirits, and that was through the hands of, uh, of the Agile. So it was the second year uh, on campus, and uh, the, uh, as, as it happens in the second year of the MBA, uh, companies come in to present. And, um, uh, you know, I was, I was really happy in, in Bain, and my plan was to come back to uh, management consulting after uh, the MBA. But um, suddenly I, I saw this explosion of, uh, you know, fun, incredibly well-built brands uh, and, and you know, all, all the beauty that you can find in the in the spirits category. And that got me really thinking, you know, and I felt deep inside of me, you know, there is something about this that I really love beyond uh, the normal, you know. And so I started the, the conversation with them. And then uh, a few months later, when I finished my MBA, I had the opportunity to, uh, to join them. I joined them in the um, um, in the in the Madrid office, um, and that was uh, that was actually a fantastic time. So it was a phenomenal learning. Uh, whilst living in Oslo, we had our first kid, which was Sofia. Sofia today is 13 years old, um, and uh, and uh, you know it was it was really a, a, a lifetime experience to have my first kid in uh, in Norway. Really, um, I don't know if you're much aware of how it works in Scandinavian countries, but uh, almost by law, you're forced to take at least one month of uh, leave, if not uh, half a year. Uh, in my case, I was completely shocked coming from Spain, and I was like almost, uh, uh, you know, thinking that I can't think right now even three weeks, you know, because this is, I mean, I just literally joined that company. But uh, so I managed to actually spend uh, a few weeks with uh, with Sofia as a, as a proper uh, father, and that was a gift, you know. Um, after that, I uh, spent uh, one more year in, in this company, and then, uh, you know, things uh, evolved. Um, uh, I, I got different headhunters contacting me. And one of them came up with an interesting proposal that was for uh, joining a big consumer electronics company in the Netherlands, uh, which is Philips. They wanted um, a new breed of marketeers helping them to move from a um, product centric perspective to a consumer pr uh, focused perspective. Uh, and, and they wanted international marketeers with uh, you know, high caliber and, and high potential. And um, uh, the, the um, um, Hosting was based in the Netherlands, in in uh, um, Amsterdam. I love Amsterdam. I've always liked it, and I felt that you know that's new challenge alongside with you know being able to travel and living in Amsterdam, being part of a talent pool of young marketeers uh, in in the world of consumer electronics was something that I really was very interested. You know, um, so um, I spoke to my wife and I said, well, you know, I uh, I made my time here in in, in also with you. Um, we've had a fantastic time, but I'm really keen to pursue this opportunity, and I think she was really understanding. So we packed the the bags, and uh, and uh, also we packed our second kid, which uh, was just born, Beatrice, and uh, we uh, went to the Netherlands. Um, that was a, an incredible experience as well. Uh, spent our three years in uh, in, in Amsterdam and uh, loved it. So of course we bought the bike, we bought no car. Uh, Beatrice was so little back then that um, we brought her with her Maxi Cosi and actually we went so Dutch 
that uh, instead of um, you know having a car, we just bought these uh, big bicycles that they call the backfits. And those are basically, I don't know if you've seen it, but they are quite uh, uh, basic in the sense that they have like literally like a wooden case on the front. Um, and in that case, that uh, wooden case was fixed in a way that we, we could actually attach the, the, uh, the maxi cosy of the baby, you know? So we would drive that thing with the baby attached to this uh, wooden box. And uh, for anyone that has been to the Netherlands, you know how the cyclists go there is like mad, you know? So at the beginning it was a bit of a scary experience, but after, after that a little while, we actually loved it. And, uh, you know, we really enjoyed the time there. And uh, through um, uh, my development in the company, another uh, opportunity came in. So they wanted to have um, a brand director, marketing director running the, the, the Nordix business um, for the entire consumer lifestyle portfolio. Uh, my wife, obviously being Norwegian and uh, linked to the uh, Scandinavian markets, thought it was a really interesting opportunity as well because then she could continue uh, pursuing her, her professional life uh, based out of Stockholm. So we went as expats uh, for three years to Stockholm and, um, and we loved the experience. I think Stockholm is a fantastic city. And all of a sudden Bacardi came in and um, I started the conversation with them. Uh, it was for a really interesting role in London. Um, and uh, you know, one month later, basically I had a, an offer and I was part of the Bacardi family, you know? So it went, uh, it went really fast. And uh, again, my wife, uh, which I'm always grateful to uh, said yes to that as well. So we relocated to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the UK again and uh, spend there, uh, you know, a, a really nice time, uh, three years, uh, you know, enjoying the, uh, the, the beauties of, of this amazing city. Um, until again, another opportunity came in. This time was becoming the head of marketing for Latin America. That's been my, my latest role before I joined um, the, um, the global travel retail team. So um, uh, the opportunity was to be relocated to Panama. Uh, and uh, become the VP for uh, for life, so Latin America and Caribbean markets. Uh, and yeah, we, we've been there for two years and a half. Amazing experience, incredible part of the world. I think the, the vibe that you get from uh, the, uh, the sense of opportunity that you get from emerging markets uh, is, uh, is, is basically um, unique. And, uh, and it helps you really develop and open your minds. At the same time, of course, the level of volatility that you get in those markets is quite interesting as well. So I think that balance is every day in, in, in your life very constant. I mean, you literally wake up every day feeling, you know, today can be the day, but also today you can wake up and uh, that there is, you know, this uh, dictator doing this in this market or so all of a sudden there is this, uh, uh, you know, huge inflation happening here that is affecting your business or this distributor has gone bankrupt, you know. But I think that's, uh, that keeps you really alive and, and living in the moment. And it's a, it's a really energizing feeling, I have to say. So, um, so yeah, that's been basically the, uh, the, the journey. And, uh, you know, a year ago, uh, uh, we felt that um, um, it was time to, uh, to head back to London. Um, my wife wanted to continue again with, uh, with her career. And uh, I discussed uh, within Bacardi what opportunity is going to have. And, um, and all of a sudden, we, we had this uh, amazing opportunity, you know, having the, the global travel retail team in the marketing side. Um, yeah, the timing was, was quite special. I'm not going to deny this. But um, we'll cover this maybe later on in, in, in the conversation. I think there's a huge opportunity here, you know, and I, and I do not regret by a second uh, my choice. Uh, furthermore, I think it's going to be a, a, you know, a booster in many ways in my career. So really excited to be here and, uh, you know, to be here with you today. It, um, it reminds me a bit of a story, actually, Ignacio, and one that you'll understand uh, more than most. I just joined travel retail, I think in 2008 in Diageo. So I'd not traveled to many international Diageo offices. I've been to a few. And one of the things that fascinates British with uh, the Spanish is siesta, uh, so an afternoon sleep. So I remember going to the office uh, thinking, you know, you know, having the sort of British jokes in mind. And when I got to the office and the Madrid office, Martin, is, is amazing. Absolutely, uh, it's a beautiful office, great big terrace. And when I got there, Ignacio, I just remember there was about four siesta rooms, Martin, with beds in. <laughs> and um, I honestly couldn't believe it, Ignacio. Um, but yeah, it was, I, I don't know if they're still there, but um, it kept up with the stereotype. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that probably they're not there anymore. I think a lot of things have changed in Spain ever since. But uh, yeah, definitely siesta was something that was... Uh, institutionalized back in the days and uh you know you could use that time the way you wanted some of them use those rooms uh many others like me went to the gym and uh you know made the best out of it but uh yeah it's, it was it was quite unique i think today 
Spain is, is uh, gravitating towards uh, really the rest of uh, Western Europe and in that sense be more um, effective with uh, time management also because you know it's it's a bit uh, manic you know that you spend an hour and a half two hours on lunch and then you push all your uh, second half of the agenda to very late you know so then you yeah. end up having you know compromising on your on your personal life which is not uh, not really sustainable so I think uh, you know it's, it's changed a little bit but yeah I uh, I reckon that's uh, that feature that you mentioned there. Yeah. Um, Ignacio you did and, and I also mentioned that uh, you came in at a tricky time for the business, to say the least. Uh, and you came in with a marketing brief at a time when the business had really almost stalled worldwide. Um, we've moved on a bit. We've taken some steps forward. We've taken some occasional steps back, but we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel, unquestionably. But it was, it was a tricky time. How did you kind of go about the job? Then, how did you set out your priorities, and and maybe just leading up to the current day, how do you see things now? Yeah. Um, well, I guess you know to, to begin with, definitely, um, the, if you if you summarize the situation when I just joined, it almost looks like one of those uh, case studies that you read in Harvard. You know, when you have like the perfect storm forming up. Uh, and then, uh, you know, an impeccable answer to that comes and then effectively uh, you have a great resolution, you know, and this is the way I envision this. Of course, that incredible resolution is not there yet. I think we're going to have to work it uh, over time. Um, uh, but, but it's true that we definitely see things much clearly now. And, uh, and I think it, 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 uh, it, it's definitely a huge opportunity. That's the way I look at it. So um, when, when I joined, basically, I had um, a good conversation with, uh, with Vinny, my line manager. And uh, we were clear, clear about one thing, and that thing was that uh, you know if um, if there is an element of uh, disruption uh, because of COVID, uh, travel retail probably is taking it all, you know. And uh, and from that point of view, um, we need to look at uh, what are the options and what are the things that we want to uh, make differently um, once COVID is behind us, you know. And uh, I think there was mutual agreement that the top priority was going to be omnichannel. Uh, and digital. So, so for us, I think uh, in the um, in the year that I've been sort of uh, running the team, we've we've uh, single-mindedly focused on driving this uh, huge transformation in terms of moving from a product and physical space-led uh, um, um, operation uh, to a um, um, digital and physical uh, only channel operation. Um, as well as, of course, the opportunity that we have with Hainan in China, you know, which, by the way, is probably the best example of an omnichannel uh, um, market uh, that exists globally. So I think that has been obviously the, the main priority um, on the people side, because, as you know, Bacardi is a, is a very, uh, very much people oriented company. Obviously, the, the main focus has been on keeping balance and keeping the team engaged and excited, you know, and I think uh, We've managed to do, to do this successfully to date, uh, mostly because we do really believe in uh, in what we have ahead of us. I think, as opposed to other companies, and I was discussing this with Roger um, uh, a few days ago, um, Bacardi does believe in this channel, and uh, and as opposed to uh, you know companies that maybe are stock listed and need to examine themselves on a quarterly basis and uh, do rough adjustments uh, to uh, make the numbers fit. Uh, we have actually that long-term vision and we can actually flex uh, to keep on the investments and the commitments with, uh, with retailers and with our own employees uh, because we know that this is going to come back, you know. So in that sense, it's been a, a blessing that uh, uh, that's, that mindset is there to, to enable us to do our work. And uh, there's been great support uh, from everyone in the company in terms of driving this omnichannel transformation. So from the CEO to the CFO, uh, uh, global head of HR, everyone has been really involved in, uh, in, in, in helping us in making this change happen. And uh, I think we're, we're doing some really exciting tests today with some big retailers. And of course, we're doing a lot of things in, in China and some of them, and Martin, you have already um, brought to life in, uh, in, in the Moody David report. And, um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's basically happening, which is really exciting for us, you know. And uh, so one thing that I, 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 you know, I tell my team, I tell myself, and I tell, I tell everyone when they, when they ask me, hey, so how is it going with your job? And they look at me with this sort of big poppy eyes uh, face. And I said, well, you know what? Businesses have a very short memory. And the reality is that maybe today is a bit of a struggle. But I can tell you that the moment that we start delivering double digits over past year, uh, for three, four quarters in a row, and this becomes the norm, you will all of a sudden be, become the hero, you know? And if you accompany this go back to growth 
with a new model that we know is going to work, I think we can take global travel retail to uh, to limits that have not been seen uh, before. You know, so and that's what we're working towards, and uh, and that's the way we look at it. Yeah, and, and Ignacio, we've said before, Roger and I on this show with other guests, the human desire to travel has not been eroded by crisis; it's been accentuated. The human need to travel for the kind of family reasons that we were talking about off air earlier on have actually been accentuated because we've been away from our loved ones, so many of us around the world, and we want to travel. And also we want to go and discover great places again and get out of our lockdown situation. So I think the, the, the tap is almost just waiting to be turned on. And to come back to your role, that offers a big opportunity, doesn't it? Because marketing is going to play such a critical function in getting those people that are traveling, spending in store and experiencing in store. I think you're right, um, uh, Martin. And, uh, you know, in the past probably was, I, I, I will not say uh, an easy job, but um, the, the reality was that um, there was an ongoing growing forecast of passengers um, that was more or less easily, um, you know, manageable in the sense that we knew that it was going to happen uh, out of that amount of passengers we knew that 40 percent would drop in store out of those 40 percent we knew that uh, i don't know 10 percent was going to buy spirits out of that 10 percent you knew that a percentage was going to go uh, to your brand if you had the right um you know um value propositions in place um and i think what we see today is that uh, if you really want to grow ahead of these passengers numbers you're going to have to probably grow um, in penetration as well, and for that, um, you're going to have to probably drive not only click uh, footfall, but also clickfall to uh, uh, to the retailer domain, but also be incredibly relevant, right? Whilst we've been in lockdown, uh, all of us have been really interacting with e-commerce more than ever before, you know, um, and that means that now we've understood the uh, uh, convenience and the immediateness that uh, that e-commerce brings, you know, and that's now something that for uh, global travel retail becomes as well a, a benchmark, you know. Um, and in that sense, we, we need to uh, uh, compete against that and deliver uh, that as part of our retail vision, you know. But what we can also do in addition to that, to deliver that element of, uh, you know, e-commerce and, uh, and digital, is that we can also do something that no one else can do as us, which is deliver those physical experiences, now amplified as well with the, with the digital element, you know. And uh, not only applies to physical spaces, to all, but also to even our, our, our ambassadors, you know. We can amplify those ambassadors and uh, and make them even more connected uh, to the end consumer or shopper through digital you know so i think the uh, the opportunity is really phenomenal and uh, and i think uh, the, the, those who manage to really digitize and amplify those physical uh, presence with uh, with the digital elements uh, will definitely um, win the, the hearts and minds of the new travelers you know so i think that's uh, that's what we are after and uh, and i think it's uh, it's going to be a, a phenomenal experience as, as as market here i absolutely agree well, always on this podcast, Ignacio, we like to take our guests away from uh, their current environment, and especially um, their lockdown environment of, 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 of recent months, and we take them to our resident desert island, uh, and where we grant you a few perks so you can enjoy yourself out there. I'm going to hand over to Roger, uh, who's going to ask you about some of the things that you might like to enjoy while you're on our island. So Ignacio, as Martin said, you're on our island now. So what piece of music, favourite album or song would you have with you on the island? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think for me, there is um, uh, this um, group and uh, no surprise, but obviously it's a Norwegian group. Uh, it's a band of two and they're called Kings of Convenience. I don't know if you've heard of them or, or listened to them, but they're amazing. I mean, for me, every time I listen to these guys, uh, I feel that the world stops and it's, uh, it's the time to enjoy the moment, you know, so... I would say that that's probably the soundtrack that I would choose. Uh, I think these are these are the right guys for that setting. I haven't heard, heard of them, but... No? <laughs> okay, no, we'll, we'll... No, Martin, new to me, Martin, but I'll be uh, I'll be on iTunes straight after uh, Ignacio, so I'll, I'll let you know uh, what I think. Okay. Ign so. Ignacio, you know that Roger Roger is a Lionel Richie fan, right? That's uh, <laughs> That was his... <laughs> That was his revelation on episode one. On episode well, uh, one. <laughs> Roger, if that is the case, then I think you may not like them, but, uh, you know, let me know in any case. I, I'll let you know. Um, yeah, I am a big fan of Lionel. Um, moving swiftly on, um, so you've got some music. 
Um, what book would you bring? Uh, what's the most most read book in your life uh, that you'd bring on the island? Um, well, I'm going to uh, play a little trick in here, uh, Roger, because I normally always have like a business-like type of book uh, whilst I'm reading a leisure one. So I'm going to give you one business one and one leisure one. Okay. Um, starting with the business one, I think one of the most um, influential uh, books that I've read and most inspirational is Eat the Big Fish. I think that's a fantastic book for any challenger brands and even any well-established brand leading a category wanting to reinvent itself. I think it's a phenomenal book. So that's that's my choice in terms of business one. And uh, in terms of book for life, uh, I'm going to go for something maybe surprising, but quite simple. And that's The Little Prince. You know, I think for me, that is a, an incredible story of uh, ingenuity and simplicity and sometimes you know how um, full of opportunities and, and bright the world looks like if you look at it through the child's eyes so I think that's a that's a good one to, uh, to keep in mind always you know yeah it's a beautiful book um, and then on the island we've got your music we've got your book you allow three people to be flown in uh, they can be uh, dead or they can be alive uh, so who would you have uh, your dinner guests you allow three people Three guests. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm gonna go for maybe um, a, a very uh, disconnected um, uh, meeting in here, but uh, probably from that disconnection is where the, the best uh, meetings happen. I think the first one I would like to bring back would be uh, my uh, uh, grand grandfather. So uh, he was a, a very famous bullfighter uh, back in the days and a good friend of the King of Spain. Uh, uh, never got color. Yeah. <laughs> So he was he was really an absolute personality and uh, and one of the uh, authorities in, in the bullfighting world. I don't I don't follow bullfighting and I'm not very much uh, uh, you know um, accepting it uh, nowadays. But but still I think it was it was really interesting and uh, and I and I would love to meet him and uh, and know him better. Um, was he a bullfighter, Ignacio? Bullfighter, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he was a bullfighter. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So uh, he was like, uh, and uh, we got some really old pictures uh, at home where, uh, you know, you would have him uh, fighting and it was like fighting those bulls back in the days, you know, which were like uh, huge bears, you know, not like we have today, which is not, I'm, I'm not going to insult today's bulls. But so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it was a really big personality, you know, and uh, there are books written about him. He's got his own streets uh, in, in, uh, in Cordoba in Spain where he was born. So yeah, I would have loved to uh, to meet him in person and uh, and hear from him, you know, how the post-war time was and uh, and uh, how how um, you know how being a famous bullfighter was. Um, I guess the second one would be probably, and and this is a bit of a stereotype, but um, you know, with with all digital disruption happening right now, I would love to uh, go back to the origins and maybe meet Mr. Steve Jobs, you know, bring him back to life. And uh, he's a very polarizing uh, character, but at the same time, I mean undoubtedly a genius you know so we would love to spend time with him and ask him some questions and then completely disconnected but i'm reading now this uh, biography of, of uh, genghis khan and uh, i think the guy is simply amazing you know the the, the job that he uh, managed to do with uh, you know with a tribe of really crazy radical uh, guys and uh, conquering a big part of the world uh, for me is uh, still to date uh, a really interesting example of what uh, humanity can do, you know. So um, yeah, that 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 will be probably will be my my selection again. Very disconnected, but uh, but interesting people. That's that's some dinner party. Uh, <laughs> I think there could be a bit. I think there could be a bit of violence there. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, but I, th I think you'll need your music playing to keep everyone quite calm. <laughs> probably you're right. Yeah. We'll need to play in Lionel Richie, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, listen, on this island, of course, Ignacio, it would not be right if we didn't allow you to take a duty-free item with you. You can be as biased and parochial as you like in your choice. We'll give you, we're, we're, you've got to stick within your allowance, but uh, what would it be? What would you take? Yeah, okay, that's perfect. Well, if it is a high an allowance, then it's a bit more generous, but uh, I would probably stick to um, uh, definitely our, our portfolio and, uh, and my brand of choice would be Patron. So I would probably go for a Patron Reposado. And uh, whilst I was in Latin America, I really uh, discovered this brand and I completely fell in love with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, what I love about it is that there are so many ways in which you can enjoy it. I mean, I, from an old fashioned to a perfect margarita or simply sipping on the rocks, you know. All right. Well, you've been on this island, but we're going to give you a, a, a break somewhere else after it, Ignacio. You haven't had, like most of us, too many holidays in, in recent times. So once you're off the island, we'll take you 
anywhere in the world that you'd like to be. You can go with your, your wife and, and children. Where would it be and why? Uh, so, um, uh, Martin, actually, the, the timing is perfect for your offer, and I'm going to take it because um, a couple of days ago, we're driving in the car, and uh, my daughter, Sophia, has been insisting now for months that she wants to go to the uh, Greek island of Santorini. And um, what we have agreed is that because next year, uh, Marianne, my wife, and, and myself, we make uh, 15 years of being married, we're going to remarry in uh, Santorini if everything is open and, and uh, you know, and things allow. And um, uh, I said to Sophia that we're going to do the Santorini on the one, one condition. And that condition is that she needs to find me a new uh, wedding ring because uh, 10 years ago we were in, uh, um, uh, in, in holiday uh, in Mauritius. And uh, whilst I was scuba diving, I lost my ring. And uh, shame on me, but I've never replaced it again. There is no reason behind it, simply that uh, we, we haven't had the chance to do it. So I said to Sophia, now that I'm going to remarry, I need a ring and you need to bring it. So uh, that will be the, uh, the only condition. But yeah. Santorini is a choice then. A oh, brilliant choice, beautiful place in a, in, a, in a beautiful country. And we've got that in recording now, and we're gonna make sure that your wife listens to this, Ignacio, and we'll see you on the show in a year's time with that ring on your hand. Definitely. I'll bring pictures as well of the wedding. Yeah, Ignacio, thank you so much. Um, you, I can only echo what you said about Bacardi. I obviously am quite lucky to work with you, you and your team as well. Um, on the distribution side, but I think exactly everything you said around how uh, Vinay, um, the leadership team, your leadership team have dealt with COVID. I've got to say, you know, you really are up there uh, as in terms of best in class in the industry. And I think one of the things people really overlook when they look at travel retail is exactly what you said, which is when this turns back on, which I think will happen pretty quickly as in terms of when it does, you know, a lot of your competitors are going to be scrabbling around for six or 12 months trying to rehire, trying and then build capability. And unfortunately, in travel retail, as we know, that doesn't happen overnight. And I think uh, brands like yours and brand owners like yourself, I think will be, you know, we'll have two, three years of expedited growth because of that. So uh, big thanks to you for coming on, Ignacio, and we wish you all of the luck, which I'm sure you don't need, but I'm, uh, I'm really sure we'll see your brands hitting the top of some of those Nielsen share surveys really soon. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thanks, Ignacio. Thanks very much. So we'll see you, see you soon. Take good care. Yes. Bye. So time to wrap up, Roger. That was good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was great to be back. A uh, couple of weeks holiday for us both. So and, and now back with it. I think having Ignacio as a guest uh, was great to come back with, uh, to hear someone from uh, you know marketing role as well really exciting so I think if you look at his outlook and how he's looking at the industry uh, and Vinay and the whole Bacardi team actually it's really refreshing so I think a lot of good things to come from Bacardi I think they really understand this channel uh, they've proven they're here to stay uh, and that they haven't you know messed around with their team uh, so their team's ready and raring to go so yeah really we'll have to watch what Bacardi do Martin because my uh, my guess on this would be in the next 18, 24 months, those guys are going to be really taking some share. Yeah, I think so. And, and clearly plenty in the pipeline as well of, of innovation. So that was great. Well, Roger, thanks again for being with us. We'll see everybody back uh, very soon with another special guest and a good chat about the state of the travel retail world. For now, though, I'm Martin Moody. See you next week. See you next week.